OK, so uh, yeah, thank you all for attending this session uh, so close to the Christmas break. Um, I'm Emma, uh, symbol as, as introduced me, I'm a PhD student at the Camarades Group um, and I'm one of the, the organisers of reproducibility uh, here at Edinburgh as well. And today I'm going to be talking about um, open research across the, the disciplines. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at a resource that the UK Reproducibility Network has created, which collates various examples of open research across many different disciplines and hopefully discuss some of the considerations that you may have, um, depending on what um, discipline you work in. Um, great, sorry. Right. Um, so I'm going to start just by briefly describing what is open research. Uh, essentially, it's about making research practices and findings more transparent and accessible. Um, I found this definition of open research on the one of the university's web pages, um, and it's describing open research as research that's conducted and published via a combination of two or more of the following attributes, and these are including open access publication, open research data, uh, open source software and code, open notebooks, uh, open infrastructure and the pre-registration of studies. So yeah, I think it's really important that we consider that open research isn't just kind of publishing open access at the end, it's a whole kind of variety um, of things that we can do. Um, so at this talk, I'm going to be referring to open research, not open science, although some people do refer to open science. Um, open research itself is a much more inclusive term because no matter whether you're based in STEM or the humanities, um, we're all doing research and many of the open research practices that we use in STEM can be applied to the humanities and humanities can be applied to STEM, um, as you'll hopefully see in this presentation. Um, and additionally, if you just consider the University of Edinburgh as a whole research institution, um, we're not just doing either STEM or arts and humanities. You know, we've, we've got departments that, that do one or the other. So Edinburgh as a whole, um, we're doing research. We're not just doing science. Um, so why is open research important? Um, there are so many benefits. There are too many to fit on the slide. I could do a full talk about that. Um, but I've listed a few here that are grouped into different categories. So firstly, there's, there's benefits to individual researchers um, using things like electronic lab notebooks, managing your data well and writing um, reproducible code to analyse your data can help you keep track of decisions that you made throughout your research and ultimately makes it easier when it comes to writing up your results. Um, benefits to the scientific community. Um, um, sorry, <laughs> it can be easier to, to verify research results when the, the methods and analysis that we use are transparency reported and um, data are shared using open licenses. And this means that they can be used in new context um, and furthering advancements within research. Um, and this can be benefits to your own research community or another um, I've noticed that I've used scientific community here, so I do apologise because of the previous slide. Um, but, you know, um, research that's used in one context can then be used in another context. So research that, that benefits one field can, can then be used to benefit another um, if it's shared openly. And finally, there's benefits to the, the wider public. Um, a lot of Research is publicly funded, so it's it's our duty if we're publicly funded to to make our research um, widely available. Um, and publishing open access, for instance, improves the access to our research findings, meaning that the people can read our our work for free. Um, so obviously, it's in every researcher's best interest uh, to work openly. Um, however, often when we're looking for the guidance on how to implement open research practices, you might find one of two things. You're either going to find really general guidance that's hard to apply to your research context because you want to know specifically how to do it for, for your research, 
or you might find specific guidance that's related to another field. Um, a lot of it is um, a lot of the resources might be related to psychology. If you're a physicist, for instance, you might say, well, how is that relevant to me? Um, so obviously this isn't always helpful. Um, and what researchers want is guidance that is, feels specific to them and feels like it will be useful to them. Um, last year, uh, back in 2021, feels so long ago, um, I was working with the, the UK Reproducibility Network to develop um, open research train the trainer courses. And whilst we were doing that, we kind of overwhelmingly found that when researchers wanted to go on a training course to learn about open research practices, they wanted it to be specifically about them. Um, data sharing, for instance, they didn't just want to learn about data sharing generally and learn about how to create metadata files, how to structure their data in a certain way. They, they wanted to learn about in the context of their specific type of data. So they wanted to know, how do I do this if I've got genomic sequencing data? How do I do this if I've got imaging data? How do I do this if I've got data from patients? Um, and that was more useful for them than just kind of general guidance. Um, so to help with this, uh, the UKRN have developed um, a document and a web page with specific examples of open research practices across many different research disciplines. Um, the document is updated annually and it was last updated in October this year. Um, it's available on the Open uh, Science Framework as yes. a preprint and all the, the resources linked mm -hmm. um, can be found in the web page on the UKRN website. My, my issue, so I think someone's unmuted. <laughs> um, OK, I think we're fine. Um, yeah, so this, this is the reference here and, and the um, the web page and the, the links are in the, the slides that should be in the chat and are on OSF. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of disciplines covered uh, within the resource. This is slide one of two. Um, so there's, I think there's 28 different disciplines in total, but you can see that we're covering archaeology and classics. Um, artificial intelligence, chemistry, computer science, um, economics and engineering. So we've got a lot of things here. And um, hopefully something that covers something that's interesting to, to everyone who's attending this talk. Um, got health sciences, history, law, leisure and tourism. We've got math, we've got physics, psychology, veterinary science. So there are a lot of, of different things that they have um, considered um, and looked into, which I think is really, really useful. Um, so looking specifically what kind of resources are provided, um, there are case studies for each different discipline. There's examples of open research practices. There are some general resources, but there's also um, resources related to open methods, open data and open outputs that are specific um, to each discipline. So this can include data repositories for a specific uh, discipline, data standards for a di certain discipline, um, as, well, as well as the more general stuff. Um, and on their, on their web pages, they also do have this link to contribute. If you've got any new resources or resources that you think should be included within um, the, the document, the web page, um, you can submit them via the Google form, you can submit anonymously, or you can include your name and ORCID ID, which allows you to be acknowledged as a, as a contributor. Um, so in, the, in this next part of the, the talk, I'd like to go through some examples of the available resources. So I had a look through a lot of the pages, a lot of the disciplines, things that aren't relevant to me at all, but I tried to find ones that, that looked quite cool. Um, so I've chosen six to go through. Obviously, there's a lot more, um, but these were some interesting ones that I found. Um, the first one was in art and design, um, and this is open access at the National Gallery of Art. Um, so the National Gallery of Art have an open access policy for public domain artworks. Um, they've got over um, 50,000 downloadable artworks. Um, I've 
put one of them in here. I've chosen something um, a bit Christmassy. <laughs> and so we've got uh, the nativity. Um, they really, I'm really quite impressed. It's high quality um, images um, and they're all, they're public domain. So you can use them um, in your slides and your presentations, whatever you want to do with them, even if you're not an artist. Um, and they've also got a data set of over um, 130,000 information about over 130,000 artworks and artists that are available on GitHub. Again, that you can use for your own analysis or even just to, to look through if you're interested. Um, and within the field of artificial intelligence, um, I found this paper um, about recommendations on creating reproducible AI. I thought this was quite an interesting topic because AI seems to be kind of used more and more and I think the public and we're kind of learning about it um, a lot more. There's a lot of these chatbots going around. There's um, tools that you can use to create AI generated art. It's all very interesting. Um, and AI is also used within research, but it's very important to make sure that it is reproducible and open and not just this kind of scary black box that we're not actually sure what, what it does. Um, so I thought that was that was a really interesting read as well. Um, I found this this case study from a PhD student in economics. So this is, um, he's now graduated, so he's a doctor, um, and he was writing about his experiences of doing open research as a PhD student and why he thinks it can benefit PhD students um, within economics. And I really like this quote from um, his case study, uh, the article, um, and it says, I'm passionate about, about this topic and I did not want my thesis to become just another dusty book on a shelf. And I, I don't know, I kind of resonated with that as well, because, um, you know, I, I don't just want to do research. I want it to be out there and accessible and, and open. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was that's another really good one to to read through. Um, within engineering, um, I found this um, open source 3D printing toolkit. Um, so I'm not too familiar with 3D printing myself, but reading um, about this tool. So it's um, this tool that allows anyone to convert a 3D model into the printing instructions that can be used in a, in a 3D printer. Um, it's all open source. It means that the code is shared and licensed online. And they seem to have this like really big community on GitHub that are just dedicated to creating and maintaining the code to keep the project going, which I thought was really lovely. Um, and they're they're very, very keen to make people know on their website that they're they're all open. They're not interested in kind of for profit um, organizations and big fancy kind of marketing terms they really just are um, providing a resource to help people create things which I thought was was really interesting. Hmm. Um, next uh, within music drama and the performing arts film and screen studies which is very long uh, we have this really short podcast um, on making music research open so it's a 15 minute podcast that's produced by the University like uh, University Library of UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, and it guest stars Alexander Jensenis. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Department of Musicology at the Centre for Interdisciplinary Studies and uh, Sciences in Rhythm, Time and Motion at the University of Oslo. I believe he was very recently um, he did a talk with the Riot Science Club. Um, so that's a bit of a longer talk, so you might be interested in looking at that resource as well. Um, but in this podcast, he talks about his own experiences with open research, why music research should be open, 
and he talks about this um, event based project that he runs called Music Lab, which aims to collect data during musical performances and then analyse it on the fly, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and I think music research is maybe something that I've never con considered before. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. Um, and my final example that I wanted to show you is from physics. And it's a case study about a citizen science project. So citizen science and involving the public in your research is also relevant to, to open research. So in this project, uh, the researchers, Professor um, Chris Scott, Dr Luke Bernard um, and Shannon Jones, they set up a citizen science project that looked at solar storm data on the web platform Zooniverse and they got 4,000 members of the public to take part to help them analyse um, images of solar flares to help them with their research. Um, so this is an example kind of on the screen. Um, one of the solar flares that they would look at um, and it's asking you to draw around the brightest and outermost storm fronts. Um, it's got a little tutorial um, and when I was looking around, it actually looks like they finished, uh, which is pretty cool because um, I know that when I've tried to do some kind of citizen science projects before, it can sometimes fizzle out um, and you don't get enough people to analyse your data. Um, but this is a project that they put on a website called Zooniverse. Um, if you've never heard of this before, I'd recommend checking it out. There's a lot of really interesting projects on it on a lot of different disciplines as well um, and you can also if you've got a um, citizen science project that you want to set up I believe you can contact the universe and they can help you set it up um, which is quite cool. Um, so yeah that, that was a couple of um, examples to show you what's kind of on offer with the, the, the resources. I kind of did show the ones that I thought were a bit fun but of course there are lots of other things there's um your your preprint servers your data repositories um just kind of articles that will help you do the more kind of maybe a bit boring but necessary bits of, <laughs> of open research um but in this final section of the presentation I wanted to talk about some of the barriers and challenges to working openly um, so one barrier to consider is your available funding um, and finance. It often costs money to publish open access. Um, so one of the main benefits of open access is that articles are free to read. And this is really great for researchers in low income countries who might otherwise be locked out of reading the latest research. Um, but this need to actually pay to publish your research open access. Um, it sometimes means that the researchers who would benefit from being able to read open access papers can't afford to publish open access themselves. Um, additionally, um, when you're looking at different disciplines, um, it's something that I've always been aware of that there's potentially there's imbalances in how PhD students are funded depending on their degree. Um, so obviously this is just one university in one country, but if we look at data from the University of Cambridge, we found that in, in um, 2020 to 2021, um, only 52% of their arts and humanities PhD students were fully funded, and this compares to 83% of biological sciences PhD students. Um, so obviously no one, no one um, discipline is, is fully funded, but there's this, it seems to be much more common within the arts and humanities to maybe do a PhD that is self-funded. Um, and, and I think that has to be considered when you're thinking about perhaps costs to publish, costs to attend courses. Um, so yeah, there, there is potentially a bit of a disparity there. Um, the other one is sort of your time and your priorities. It can take a lot of extra time to, to start working openly. Um, so if you have to, to learn new skills, for instance, programming, or you need to set up new infrastructures like 
um, moving from just using regular lab notebooks to electronic notebooks or managing your data um, in, a, in a way that's reproducible. Although it can save you time in the long run, it can take a lot of time to set up. Um, additionally, some PIs might prioritise open research more than others. I'm very lucky that I have um, a PI who is very interested in um, open research and reproducibility. Um, any of the, the PIs and supervisors that are here today, obviously you're, you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, but there are other supervisors who maybe aren't and for students um, and postdocs, depending on who is supervising you, that might depend on whether you are able to, to take the time out to learn and implement these practices and the overall lab culture towards open research practices will have a big impact on the students and postdocs. 